today as we come to the table. God made a promise of covenant for the coming seed, the coming Christ, the promised one. You ever wondered, again, this brings an obvious question up, and that is, what about people that didn't know the name of Jesus before he came? The Bible says there's no other name under heaven or earth by which a man can be saved except the name of Christ Jesus, Acts 4.12. You go, wait a minute, what about Abraham and all those who didn't even know the name of Jesus? What about those who never hear the name of Jesus? His point is, if you believe in God's promise to send a Savior, whether you know his name officially or not, there's salvation salvation that's available. So all those who believed in the promised seed and the one that would come afterwards, that's how they heard the gospel. Most Americans, if not all, know who Jesus is. They're probably also familiar with the basic Christian beliefs about salvation. But what about people living in remote villages who've never heard about Jesus? What about everyone who died before Jesus was even born, including people in the Old Testament? How are they saved? Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary, Knoxville. Today, Pastor Mark teaches you that the only way anyone can get to heaven is through believing in Jesus. That has never changed. People who've never heard of Jesus are saved through faith in God's promised Savior for their sins. If you've heard of Jesus but have never accepted Him as your Savior, make that choice today. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, with today's edition of Come to the Table. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Galatians chapter 3. As we'll be looking today, Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through uh, the end of the chapter. And we're going to be looking at the sureness of the promise and the purpose of the law. And so I want to lay a foundation here. Why don't we look at, uh, in chapter 3, let's read verses 15 through 18. Kind of just read the first few, kind of lay a foundation. And then we'll jump into it and begin to look at this more fully. Notice what Paul says there in chapter uh, 3, verse 15. He says, brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you've made so clear in your word the purpose of the law, the sureness of your promise, and the purpose of your law. Lord, the two go hand in hand. You have guaranteed us certain things in your word and you've told us what the law is for and there's so much confusion. Lord, in in young believers, oftentimes even in churches and movements in what the law's purpose is. And I pray that you would give us rest in that sureness of promise, but give us understanding in that purpose of law so that we might not only stand firm where we are in it, Lord, but that we might be able to be a witness and a testimony to others around us that they might understand why you've done what you've done and why you've said what you've said through the law and through your promise. So Lord, open your word to us now. We pray that you would teach us this morning and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now again, God's word has different places that uh, oftentimes focus more on doctrine than others. This is one of the most wonderful sections of doctrine, which means teaching in all the Bible. And matter of fact, in all of Galatians, 
as I've been studying through Galatians, this section that we're looking at today may be one of the most important, if not the most important uh, areas in understanding the law. And that is what we're going to see Paul talk about today is the purpose of the law. And he's going to give a really clear understanding. And I hope that I can relay it as clearly as Paul does. It's going to be broken up into two segments today. Number one, that is the sureness of the promise. That is, you have the guarantee in Jesus and the promise that God has given you as a believer in Christ, but then the understanding of, okay, then why do we have the law if that promise is in place? And so the two are going to go hand in hand, and Paul will continue his argument for faith in Jesus as opposed to the law of God, but he's going to focus on these two distinct areas and really bring them together. And really that's what the believing life is about, is the fullness of God's word and having that balance and understanding it uh, in its entirety. You know, God is a very logical and reasonable God. Everything that he does has a purpose and a reason, and we're going to see the same is true with the law. Uh, nothing is more unsure or rather unsettling than uncertainty. And if you've ever been in a situation where there's uncertainty in your life, it's very unsettling. I think about if you're stranded far from home by a storm, maybe a flight that can't get out and you need to get back. Maybe your wife needs you for something, your kids need you for something. And it's more than just wanting to get home. It's really a need to get back. It's very unsettling to know, are you going to be on that flight? Are, did you, are you going to make standby? Are you even going to make it because of the weather? Whatever the case might be, there's an unsettledness in uncertainty. And God wants us to be those who have maybe uncertainties in this world are going to be a reality, but those of us who have settled certainties in the kingdom. And so Paul's going to make sure that he nails this down so that we're not unsettled in the uh, promises of God and also that we're not in lacking understanding in the purpose of God. And so again, we see the promise there. As I said, we'll see the purpose, which I believe uh, without understanding the purpose of the law is that is there's not an understanding of what we're supposed to do with the Bible, especially the Old Testament. And I guess a summation of this, and Paul's going to break it down very detailed as we go through this passage, but a summation would be is the law's basic purpose is to keep us in line until the Holy Spirit can take over our life through love and power from heaven. And that is, it's a guardian of us. Again, Paul will uh, uh, address this more fully as we get into the passage. But is, that is the word of God, the law, if you will, keeps us in line through the years of immaturity that we might be preserved until the maturity comes. A very famous evangelist by the name of Leonard Ravenhill, you may have heard of him, a revivalist he was really known as, in the last day's newsletter that he wrote, he shared about a group of tourists who were visiting a very picturesque village, and as they walked by an old man sitting beside a fence, one of the tourists decided to ask them a question, and yet in a rather patronizing way, one of the tourists asked the old man, he said, old man, uh, were, any, were there any great men who were born in this village? And it says the old man paused and then replied, nope, only babies. The bottom line is we all start out as babies in immaturity. It's interesting how God has done this. We have the immaturity of a baby in the physical life, but we also have it in the spiritual life as well. And God, I believe, has given that to us as a picture of what it's like growing as a believer. You grow up, you're a child, you need boundaries, you need guidelines, you have those who help you with those boundaries and guidelines, and then hopefully one day you mature to a place where now you can truly live as a productive citizen in society. The same thing is true in the believer. You're a baby Christian, you get born again, and yes, you've got the Holy Spirit restraining you from the very beginning, so to speak, but there's a lot of things you don't understand. There's a lot of issues that need to be worked through, and God tutors you, and he grows you, and he ministers to you as you're growing into the place of full maturity as a believer. And of course, we won't be fully mature till heaven, but you get what I'm saying, and now we can be a productive member of the body of Christ, producing fruit and being used for God's kingdom. And so Paul here is going to make this analogy today and show how indeed these two go hand in hand, the surety of the promise, and yet the purpose of the law, so that there's understanding. And again, remember, Paul had to make sure they were settled in the sureness of the promise because the Jews were coming in, the Judaizers, the Christian Jews, and telling them they couldn't really be saved unless they followed the law, which would make them unsettled and uncertain. But then Paul's going to go on in the second half, as we talked about, and say, all right, if that's the case, if you're settled in the fact that you're in Jesus and in the kingdom of God, then why have the law at all? And Paul does a beautiful job. Again, Paul was a master, and I know the Holy Spirit worked through Paul. But again, this is a, a tremendous portion of Scripture as far as teaching and doctrine and education for the believer in the body of Christ. So we begin with the promise of God. Look what he says here in verse 15. He says, brethren, I speak in the manner of men. So I'm going to make a man's argument first. Okay, an earthly argument, then he'll transfer over to a heavenly or spiritual argument. 
Though I speak in the manner of men, it is only a man's covenant, or though if it is only a man's covenant, yet it is confirmed, notice that, no one annuls or adds to it. So what he's saying is, he says, let's talk for a minute here about covenants. He says, even a legal covenant between men is binding and in no way can simply be added to or taken away from without some type of legal justification and authority to do so. And his point is going to be, even if men have covenants that can't be broken easily, how much more so God? So he's laying this foundation. I mean, when you sign a, a contract for your house, you can't just go and say, hey, I changed my mind. You know, once you've already, the loan is done, the money's been paid and all that's done, you can't just go back. You can go, you can sell your house and you can start the process of getting rid of it, but you have to take a legal process to now relieve yourself from that burden and from that responsibility. And so he's saying, look, this is true among men. And if men honor these covenants and men are sinful and men are fallen, and notice he says things that are confirmed among men, he uses a past tense word here, the word confirmed, it can't be changed. He's saying if that's the case, he's going to make the point in verse 16, how much more so God's promise? Because it was made by covenant as well. Look at verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Again, notice the past tense. Man's promises confirmed and had to be kept. Now God's promise to Abraham confirmed, past tense, has to be kept. Notice he says, he does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. Paul says God made the promises to Abraham and his seed, singular, meaning Jesus, um, and it came through his line, the promise to Abraham. There's going to be a promised seed, a Messiah, a Savior of the world. It's a covenant that God is making in promise, and God is going to honor that covenant even more so than man honors his earthly co covenants. You know, God's going to honor it even more. It's the promise of salvation through your bloodline, Abraham, all the way to Jesus, and then to anyone and everyone who believes in Jesus after that. And notice also he points out the promise to Abraham was concerning the Christ. Notice he doesn't mention Jesus here, not that he's leaving Jesus out, but he's making a point here uh, because, again, these Judaizers were coming in and making it more about uh, the law, which the law spoke about the Christ. And, of course, he knows and we know that the Christ is Jesus, but he's making the point. Before Abraham even knew that his name was Jesus, God made a promise of covenant for the coming seed, the coming Christ, the promised one. You, know, you ever wondered, again, this brings an obvious question up, and that is, what about people that didn't know the name of Jesus before he came? The Bible says there's no other name under heaven or earth by which a man can be saved except the name of Christ Jesus, Acts 4.12. You go, wait a minute, what about Abraham and all those who didn't even know the name of Jesus? What about those who never hear the name of Jesus. His point is, if you believe in God's promise to send a Savior, whether you know his name officially or not, there's salvation that's available. So all those who believed in the promised seed, in the one that would come afterwards, that's how they heard the gospel. That's how they knew the good news that they would be saved, uh, these Old Testament saints in past. And he's making that point. It's through the Christ. Abraham didn't know his name was Jesus, but Abraham knew the Christ. And he had a covenant with God that was by promise even before the Christ came, even as he had a covenant with God about how he would get into heaven, even before the law came. And we'll get to that again more in just a moment. Notice he says in verse 17, and this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, what an important word, notice that. Again, if you're an underliner, that's a great word to underline. It came 430 years after Abraham, notice this, it cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed, past tense, before by God in Christ that it should make the promise of no effect. Paul is doing a masterful uh, uh, job here at throwing away any possibility of believing that Abraham was justified by biblical law. See, the Judaizers were saying, you've got to follow the law. You better follow the Bible exactly. You've got to do this. He's coming and saying, wait a minute. Abraham didn't even have a Bible in his day. No Bible existed. He didn't have the written law. This was 430 years before God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai. So what, what he's saying is basically is those who tell you that you have to live by the law to get to heaven, what about Abraham? What about all that came after Abraham, all the patriarchs of Israel before the Bible was even given, so to speak? Now, I know there was the oral tradition. The law was passed down orally, but not in writing, so to speak. That came later in scrolls. And even for things that were written down, it wasn't until 430 years later that God gave the official law from heaven to Moses. See, this is such, a, I love this because it demolishes 
any possibility of such a thing that you have to follow the law in order to get to heaven. You see, even as man's legal covenants are binding, God's legal covenant was binding, and God made the legal binding covenant of salvation and a way to heaven before the Bible was even given. Now, when you see people that try to say you have to follow the Bible, you have to follow the law to get to heaven, this blows that argument completely away. Remember, the law is good. The law is a moral guideline. The moral side of the Old Testament and the new is to be applied to our lives. It is our guide for life. But the legal side, the two and a half to three books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, this area, he's saying these things were paid for by Jesus and they were simply there to be a, a direction to point us to Jesus, not some way that we get to heaven. And Abraham didn't even have that yet. And so if the covenant was made sure with God before it even came and can't be changed or annulled among men, it certainly can't be changed or annulled uh, among, among God or, or between God and mankind. You know, it's interesting. Th this argument here, again, demolishes any uh, logic that would come with following the law in order to please God. But you see the same thing coming into the church today by those who try to do that, but even those today who say the Old Testament is not appropriate for today. Maybe you've heard that. Well, we don't need the Old Testament today because Jesus came and now the law has been done away with. By the way, the law is only about two and a half to three books of the entire Old Testament. The majority of the Old Testament is not the law. It's the prophets, it's writings, it's all kinds of things. But if you want to get down to the legal part of the law, that's two or three books of the Old Testament. And so, and yes, we don't follow those in order to get to heaven, but again, they, they give us a good moral guideline. But here's the same argument that we make today for what Paul was making here for, for Abraham, not yet having the Bible. For those who say we don't need the Old Testament, did you know that the Old Testament was not fully written down and distributed among the body of Christ to at least 70 years and even beyond that in the early church? That is, Jesus died sometime in the 30s. And it wasn't the last book, the book of Revelation, that was even finished by, the, by John when God gave him the vision there uh, on Malta. That didn't even happen until the late 90s. So my point is this. The early church, if they did away with the Old Testament, they had no Bible to even do at Bible study. That was it. All they had was the Old Testament. So for the first 70 years of the church, if they came together and they didn't have the Bible, they'd be like, well, we don't have the Bible yet, so what are we going to do? Let's greet it a little bit longer. Let's do another worship song. And in 70 years, the generation after us, they'll have a Bible. No, they got into the Word of God. They got into the Old Testament. And so we see the Old Testament was all the early church had. So for those who say we don't need the Old Testament, it's the same thing as those who were saying you've got to live by the law or you can't go to heaven because Abraham didn't even have it. And the church, again, that's all they had until the New Testament was in writing and was there to be distributed among them. So he says, you know, this came much later. Look at verse 18. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. Look, the two are mutually exclusive. But God gave it to Abraham by promise, meaning the promises of our inheritance in Jesus override the biblical letter of the law and cannot be changed or made void because they were a covenant made with Abraham even before the law was given. I love this. It is so sure and so settling. And notice this, it also means it's not only still intact, but it's eternally intact. It's a promise that God gave. So now we see here, Paul lays out the promise. You have that surety of what God gave. It's not through the law. It's by belief in Jesus Christ. Now he changes gears. Because the obvious question from this is, all right, if it's through the promise and we don't really have to go by the legal side of the law to get to heaven, so to speak, and the Bible's just a moral guideline, a directive for our life, then what's the point of, of the law at all? Why do we even have the law? What, why did God even use the law? And now Paul gets into this starting in verse 19. Notice he says, what purpose then does the law serve? Note this, it was added. I have that circled. That's 430 years later. It was added because of transgressions until the seed, that is Jesus, should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now Paul asks again the obvious question, if we're not saved or brought close by God's law, why do we even have it? What's the point? Notice it was added or given because of transgressions. Now what's a transgression? A transgression means a willful sin. All right, it's something that we do on purpose. Maybe the, an accidental sin is the kind of thing that, now again, I'm not gonna make a big deal about breaking the speed limit being sin. Technically it is, but it's a good example for you because of what's happening here on Alcoa Highway. All right, we get there and, that, and somebody told me, I said 45 through this. Somebody said, it's 40. Oh, so I was already just rebuked and corrected here in the first service. So 40 miles an hour coming through here. And what I do is, is when I go through there, 
I don't purposefully try to speed through there, but if I don't pay attention, guess what happens? I'll be past that car going, oh, you know, and then you don't hit the brakes because the brake light comes on, then they really know your speed. So the whole thing, you're trapped, <laughs> right? So I set my, my cruise control for that little section because I know me, I'm, I just, I'm, just, I get, I just, I'm not thinking. I'll literally set it, I'll stay through there, and then I, then I can break the speed limit. No, I'm just kidding, but anyway, <laughs> but I set it through that section, why? I don't want to accidentally sin, if I can use that as an example. And again, I know that's maybe being radical, calling it sin, you, you, you're following the analogy. But let's say that I, I've gotta be somewhere. And I know it's 40, but you know what? I, I, I have to go, right? We're gonna get there, or we're gonna be late, and I choose to just break the speed limit, right? That would be a transgression. Now apply that to whatever part of your life, whatever sin it might be, something you accidentally do and something you choose to do. What he's saying is, one of the main purposes of the law, it was given because mankind, being sinful by nature, we choose to do wrong. We choose to sin. And because we choose to sin, because we choose to transgress, we've been given a righteous boundary, all right? So God says, all right, I'm gonna set this boundary up, a guideline, a boundary to help keep you in line. First, for those who will never yield to the Holy Spirit, that they might be protected. Again, God gives this boundary even for the world in general. You know, people make a fit about the Ten Commandments oftentimes, but the Ten Commandments, if it wasn't for that, who would say that it's wrong to kill someone? Who would say that it's wrong for adultery? Who would say that all these things are wrong? God gave a general guideline and basically lets the whole world look, look, here's the 10 commandments. These are the guidelines. And God did that for all of us on the earth. If, 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 if it was just open season, kill anybody you want, rape anybody you want, to, you know, take anybody's wife or husband you want without any kind of restraints, it's already bad enough, isn't it? But imagine if there was no boundary, if there was no restraint. So for the world, God does that to, for the protection of the world. For the believer, God does that so that we can grow into maturity, that we might know what it is we're to do and not to do. And the biblical law is given until, and I emphasize until, the seed or Jesus came on the scene to pay for the sins of the, uh, on the cross. Once the sins were paid for through Jesus' blood on the cross, the biblical law is no longer needed. Why? Because now you do it because you love the Lord. You don't do it because you have to. Maybe when you start hearing about God and you first started going to church or you got involved in religion, I'll put it that way, you didn't yet know God. There was no real relationship. You were trying to obey the Bible or do what you thought was right because you wanted to do the right thing and you thought you might get into trouble. So your motivation was a restraining motivation. It was a boundary. But when you give your life to Jesus and you meet him, you love him. And because you love him, it's not because I have to do this anymore. I get to obey him. I get to follow him. I get to honor him. I get to bring him glory. It's something you simply want to do. You know, we used to wear the bracelets, what would Jesus do? I think, and that's great, nothing wrong with that. But again, it's like, it's like the, the real truth is, what is our motivation? What is our motivation? Is it because we think we're gonna get in trouble or we just are supposed to be good? Or is it because we love him? See, love is something that you do simply because you have a heart for someone, not something you have to do. Now, husbands, I know this. You know this. If you've had any marriage counseling or if you've been married any length of time, when it comes to Valentine's and birthday or whatever, you're going to get that card. You're going to get those flowers. You're going to do the box of chocolate or whatever you do because that's just what you need to do and you know you need to do that. But how much better when the love grows and matures in the relationship? And oftentimes it happens maybe even more so at the beginning. It has to be rekindled later on. But how much more so when it's simply something you do even when there's not a special celebration? You know, you bring home flowers to your wife. It's like, okay, what do you want? Right? I just love you, and I want you to know it. See, that's how it should be with the Lord. The book of Galatians is a good reminder of what really matters. It's a book about being freed from your sinful lifestyle, and that freedom will open up the world to you so you can walk in God's will for your life through the power of His grace. It's not a license to live however you want, but it can be the power and encouragement you need to pursue God fully and turn away from the life you lived before you accepted God. Just as Paul is reminding the church to live their lives according to the text, you should be reading your Bible daily, too. It's a weapon against the evil and the sin of this world and will arm you with the tools you need to live a life of holiness. When you accept that it's God's power and not your own that makes this possible, you'll discover you have more strength than you ever thought possible. Pastor Mark reminds us that knowing and following Jesus is life-changing. Some people think that they have to give up everything they really enjoy if they commit to Christ, but it's exactly the opposite. 
When you trust God fully and turn your troubles over to Him, things have a way of working out. After all, God's will may not be your will, and His timing most certainly is not your timing. We know it's not easy to do this alone, so please reach out to us if you have questions. You can connect at thewaymedia.net by clicking on the Come to the Table section or give our church office a call at 865-609-1385. Again, that's 865-609-1385. We hope you'll join us for more next time on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.